tonight I'm joined by a couple of my esteemed colleagues, Ms. Allison Weber from our Buffalo office. He's a senior associate with significant Army JAG experience. Like myself, she's a former Army JAG. And we've got Eric Duncan, who's a really my go-to associate lately. Uh, he's a former Marine, he's a current, you know, always a Marine, but NCO in the Marine Corps and an associate attorney in our Buffalo office. I practice in our Houston office. I handle cases globally. This week I'm in Florida at, at Central Command. Next week I'm in Fort Wainwright in Fairbanks, Alaska. So I travel pretty frequently. So does Ms. Weber uh, around the country. Sometimes we cross paths uh, representing individuals in all branches of service uh, across the country in various cases and various proceedings uh, regarding all sorts of military issues. Tonight's presentation is going to cover the administrative discharge process. And what that means is individuals who are leaving the military prior to their normal separation process. You know, everybody signs an enlistment contract who enlists at a recruiting station and it has a duration and has an expiration. That's the normal process. Hopefully you'll, you'll serve your time and you'll ETS and you'll, you'll go on or you'll retire after 20 years or 25 years, whatever it might be. However, not everybody makes it through the duration of their enlistment agreement. Officers don't necessarily have an enlistment. They sign a, their commission and they serve uh, for a duration to their statutory obligation and they submit a resignation after their obligation is fulfilled or they retire um, at the conclusion of their service. We're not going to talk about the normal ETS process. What we're talking about tonight is what can shortchange your military service obligation. Now, there's two ways your military service obligation can be shortchanged. One is through the initiation by the command of an investigation that ultimately results in your separation before your enlistment agreement expires or before your officer service obligation ends. The other way is a medical injury and a medical impairment could result in disability evaluation process. We will probably talk about disability evaluation at a different webinar. This webinar is exclusively focused on separations for alleged uh, or purported misconduct or deficiency, such as uh, there's different ways to get separated from the for simplicity purposes and for the limitations of time we have. Most of my references will be Army. However, I am very familiar with the Milpers Man in the Navy and the, and the Marine Corps regulations, the AFIs and the Air Force, the Coast Guard instructions. But I'll, for shorthand, I'll probably use Army regulations because I spent a lot of time in the Army and I just know those off the top of my head immediately. In the Army, what they would initiate if they're accusing you of misconduct is what's called a 15-6 investigation or a commander's inquiry that will turn into a 15-6 investigation. The investigation will then determine if there's sufficient evidence to believe misconduct occurred. Let's, let's go to the scenario of an adulterous accusation. The military usually exclusively is not pro, does not prosecute adulterous behavior. They may add it as a charge to a, alleged offenses if they're trying to pile on allegations, but they usually don't exclusively prosecute alleged adulterous affairs. They don't send the MPs out to arrest people on that either. So a lot of misconceptions about that. What they do, however, is they shortcut your career substantially. So if you're accused of having an adulterous affair or having multiple sexual partners, multiple um, girlfriends or boyfriends, and somebody files a complaint with IG, the command will initiate a 15-6. They will determine if there's sufficient evidence to believe the, the allegations occurred. And if they find the elements met of service spreading behavior or prejudice order discipline or some kind of inappropriate fraternization, they may well then turn that substantiated investigation into a proposal for separation. And the proposal will say something along the lines of commission of a serious offense or pattern of misconduct. Say you have an accusation for adulterous behavior, and then six months before you had a DUI, they'll say those are two uh, items become a pattern of misconduct. The DUI alone may initiate separation by itself as commission of a serious offense, but it's something, I say, less egregious, maybe just being late to formation 15 times or something, or, or just a couple times. They, they could say that is a basis for your separation. And yes, we will touch on service academy disenrollments um, that's a little bit separate of a process, but um, we will get to that. I saw the question come in. Service academies enrollments quickly do involve usually an investigation and notice and an opportunity to go to a board. The, the Navy has what's called PRBs, performance review boards. The Army has uh, boards of inquiry, 15-6 boards, and the Air Force does an investigation alone and papers you out. So the Air Force provides the least amount of due process for the service academies. That's a whole other topic for another day. But I do want to mention that. So we are going to talk primarily tonight about the enlisted separation process and the officer separation process. For the enlisted soldiers, the pertinent regulation is Army Regulation AR 600-8-24. Um, 
there's an officer separation regulation that kind of overlaps. The National Guard has its own regulation. And but the, all the regulations, whether it's the Air Force, the Navy, the Coast Guard, whatever it might service it might be, they all follow a template and they all have a standard notice you receive. If you receive a notice, the notice should the command should advise you, look, you have a right to consult with an attorney. Once you're served with that notice, you should go talk to the Uniformed Area Defense Council to get an initial assessment of what your strategy and rights are. You always retain the right to have civilian counsel at no expense to the government. Notice that key terminology, no expense to the government. Under no condition will the government fund you a civilian counsel. So your trial defense attorney, your area defense counsel will give you an initial preliminary assessment. After responding to the notice, they may help you submit a rebuttal. They may help you prepare for a board. What is the difference? If you served under six years enlisted or under five years commissioned officer, you're probably not entitled to a board. The only exception is if the command is notifying you that they're proposing what's called an other than honorable discharge. If you're being notified of OTH, say it's alleged drug abuse for marijuana, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army will probably notify you of what's called OTH, other than honorable. The Army usually doesn't give you an OTH for one time marijuana use, but the Air Force and Navy often will try. If you get notified of that, you're entitled to a board. Do not sign a waiver of your right to a board. The Navy loves to put waivers in front of their sailors and have them papered out in two weeks. Never sign a, a waiver. If you ever see the word waiver in any document, run. Run for the hills. Demand to speak to an attorney and remember your prisoner of war training. I always advise my clients who I talk to when they're faced with the command and they're being served with administrative paperwork that's adverse to them, but don't make admissions against interest. Don't grovel and apologize at that, at that time. Simply remember your prisoner of war training, your name, your rank, share number, your date of birth, your, you know, you can give them that information, the information they already have, but do not, under any circumstances, give them any information to cooperate the allegations in the written documentation they've served you with. You're only stepping, your, shooting yourself in the foot. Now, after the consultation with an attorney, it may be best to call, fall on the sword as your defensive mechanism to try to get a rehabilitative opportunity to stay in the service. That might be appropriate. But it will be appropriate later. Don't don't grovel and make admissions against interest and apologize when you're being served with the paperwork. When you're being served with the paperwork, simply acknowledge the paperwork, sign that you received it, and then immediately upon that, make an appointment to talk to an attorney, either the uniformed attorney on base, an attorney ancillary to the installation, or call um, a civilian attorney at your own at your own expense. So that's the initial process. The notification could be for almost anything. The investigation could also be for almost anything. Commanders have significant discretion to open administrative investigations pretty much at will. And can they be one question I had earlier today was a commander opens an investigation in bad faith. Can I sue them? Well, no, you can't. They have governmental immunity. So if they're acting in their official capacity and their role as commander, no court's going to allow you to file civil suit against them for their behavior in their official capacity as a commander. It's simply not possible. So when you Join the military, unfortunately, you lose a lot of your civil rights that you would have if you were a civilian. If you were a civilian being slandered and defamed by your superiors, you might have a ancillary cause of action in civil court. In the military, unfortunately, commanders have governmental immunity almost, almost entirely. Not for everything, but pretty much for everything. So it, it's nearly impossible to get any relief under that mechanism. Going forward, Ms. Weber now is going to talk about how do we actually prepare a response? So you've been served with the paperwork saying you're deficient or you engage in alleged misconduct. Whether it's true or not, what do you, what do, you do next? Ms. Weber, uh, uh, Allison, we're going to let you speak to that. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, so I first want to echo something that Sean said. Uh, do not sign a waiver at all when you're at, with the command. And I emphasize this. Even if they say, if you don't sign this, we'll court martial you. Just so you know, you get an attorney then too. So either way, you're going to your area defense counsel, your TDS, whatever, you're going to go see that lawyer. Go see them first. Because if a waiver is in your interest, it's going to be a conditional waiver. You're going to ask to waive your board for a better discharge. They're not going to tell you that. They're just going to ask you to waive for what they want you to waive for. So that would be my one. Um, highlight to that that point because I've seen so many cases where the client comes to us years later saying but they told me I had to they were going to throw me in jail that's nice they they're you know they're basically talking it up and trying to intimidate you don't fall for it um as for preparing a response so first and foremost a written response is going to be when you do not qualify for a board 
So not that you can't prepare something anyway, but uh, when you're talking about preparing a written response, it's when you're a probationary officer or you do not have sufficient time in service in order to qualify. And they're also not recommending you for an OTH. Now, I strongly recommend that if you have anything good to say on your behalf, that you do prepare a response. There are a number of soldiers that I've encountered both while I was in and out of the military who just said, okay, whatever, and didn't turn anything in. And they also rely on the idea that their commander said, hey, it's no big deal, you can reenlist. Just so you know, commanders know absolutely nothing about reenlistment. They know nothing about whether the codes that go into your DD-214 based upon that separation are going to preclude you later from reenlisting. They don't know anything about the codes. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I have heard commanders say it, seen them um, even write it down, uh, and have really, like I said, no clue about the potential ramifications. So if you have anything, anything mitigating at all, you want to respond. You want to put something down. Um, so when we're talking about written responses, again, a lot is going to be driven based upon what you're accused of, what you're being separated for. If you take a general scenario of misconduct, the first question is, is well, did you commit it? Um, obviously, there's you know, extenuating mitigating circumstances for just about everything. But if you didn't commit it, then you, know, you obviously wanna present an actual defense to the action. If you did, but you wanna argue, but it's not as big of a deal as you think it is, that's also an option. The fall on your sword, that um, Sean mentioned is a strategy we, we pursue in a lot of cases where we put all the circumstances in there. You know, I accept responsibility for my actions. I made a mistake. I've learned my lesson. Please give me another chance. Um, that said, the client tends to write that. The attorney tends to write something else. And the attorney side is where we can test different people. But the soldier, sailor, Marine, airmen, you know, they want to, at least on some level, probably accept responsibility if there's something to accept and highlight what they've learned, the mitigation, you know, there, there's always so many parts to a story. It's not even two sides. There's so many factors that go into this. And I can tell you, your command is not aware of any of them. They're only aware of the negative side that was handed to them on a piece of paper. And in some cases, the command doesn't even know they have a choice. Uh, it's almost as if they were handed this packet by a paralegal and said, hey, here, give this to them. It is your command's decision at the end of the day, but you need to give them a reason to want to keep you. So when we're talking about paper packets, there is a nuance to doing this. Um, having the soldier airmen or even the officers uh, write their own rebuttal where they're actually contesting like technicalities and things like that, it's never going to bode well. This is the benefit to the attorney because I can point those out and sound sincere and make them question the reality of it. But if the person being separated, you come off as whining, you come off as, you know, just unwilling to accept accountability. So there are pros, and, and I say that regardless of whether you have a civilian or a military attorney, the same principle applies. Technicality, technical arguments should come from attorneys you know, actual mitigation and emotional responses, again, learning lessons that comes from the particular individual. So that's the general idea. Um, a lot of things go into those packets, letters of support. Uh, you might have everybody in your chain of command, except the approval authority may support you being retained. You wanna put that in writing. You want those letters of support in your packet, depending on how long you've been in. Maybe you have a few awards. Um, you might have an evaluation or two or a good counseling statement. Uh, those don't come as often as bad ones, but they sometimes exist. So you want to put all of that together in what, you know, we often refer to as the I Love Me book. Maybe you had some additional training, like you volunteered for some extra stuff. All of that goes into showing you as kind of the whole person concept. Again, now you're not just a number. You're not just one of a thousand troops. You are the person sitting on the other side of that desk and they can see you as a person, which makes it harder for them to say, I'm kicking you to the curb. Not impossible, but obviously a little bit harder. So anything you can do to kind of put that before them and give your story is gonna help you. Um, switching over though, if you qualify for a board, um, don't wave that either. 
again, do not ever waive a board if you have um, not spoken to an attorney about waiving a board. Uh, that is the last thing you want to do because the board is your due process. It is your one shot. You can get fully retained at the board, even if your command was willing to let you go with a general discharge and you thought that was a good deal. You never know. The facts and circumstances are going to drive that decision and you never want to waive that option without talking to someone first. Going back to my original point, you have a right to present a defense. If you have none, maybe your counsel says it's in your best interest to waive this, but waive it, you know, conditioned upon getting a general discharge. You're saying, hey, I'm not gonna make you spend the time and resources to go through all of this and push all this forward, but in exchange, I'd like to go out with a general discharge. It's still for misconduct. You get your win, I go out with a little dignity, you know, that's what your lawyer can help you decide. Presuming you don't want to waive that and you want to go to the board, though, this is the opportunity, again, for you to present your side of the story. And I was just at a board, actually, this past weekend. And honestly, I, I can tell you, the, the government puts up one side. It's, it's the same thing as a prosecutor, only the rules of evidence don't apply. So you have a three-member board sitting, you know, at the front of a room. You have a government attorney, uh, they call him a recorder, but it's the same thing as a prosecutor. And then you have you and your defense counsel, military, civilian, both, either, depends. Um, and it, it's very similar if you picture a trial. There's openings, there's evidence, there's closings. Again, just a lot of the rules don't apply. So a lot more can come in. This is both beneficial and bad, right? So negative evidence can come in that might be kept out of a court martial, but the pro for you is, is you can put a lot more positive evidence about yourself in that may not otherwise be relevant or admissible on your behalf. So you're gonna have the option to confront witnesses um, if they decide to call them. There are a lot of boards these days, I will be straightforward with this, there are a lot of boards where they try to push someone out with just the investigative file. No witnesses on behalf of the government. All they do is they task that prosecutor with saying, I offer exhibit one, which is the investigation, and I'm gonna walk you through what's in here. And they kind of just walk through the evidence of, you know, what one person said, what another, you know, et cetera. That may be all they have, um, in which case now you're not cross-examining anybody, but you can present witnesses on your own behalf, in person, telephonic, or again, by letter. They can write letters of support. Uh, what you present, there's a caveat to all this. This is not official legal advice for your individual circumstance, right? Again, it's very fact dependent, but what your counsel presents can range anywhere from a defense to the actual misconduct to, okay, it may be misconduct, but you weren't saving. So there's three questions that the board has to answer only if they get to each one. The first question the board has to answer is, is there a basis for separation? Also, you could word that as, did the person commit the misconduct that they say they committed? That that's why they're separating them. If the answer is no, ding, 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 we're done. Um, if you didn't commit the misconduct, they can't turn around and also separate you. But if they say, yes, you committed the misconduct, the second question for the board is, does that conduct warrant separation? It doesn't in all cases. There's a lot of times where there's so many other factors, extenuating mitigating circumstances. And this is where, again, you have over six years as enlisted, over five as an officer. You rely heavily on your prior experience in the military to say, look, I was awesome. I've done all these great things, but yeah, I slipped up. So taking the balance, what if you have 15 years of service and made one bonehead mistake? Does that mean you should be separated? That's really the argument. So going to the question, if the board says, no, it doesn't warrant separation, again, it's a win, you're done. The board doesn't keep going. Lastly though, if they say, yes, it does, yes, it warrants separation, then they get to the third question. The third question is going to be, what characterization of service is appropriate? And again, this goes back to a lot, not just what the command put in front of them through the recorder. This goes back to the totality, that whole person concept. So 
if you're sitting there and you decide again you're presenting like next to nothing or you decide hey i don't want to involve my my friends or colleagues in this that that could be the biggest detriment because you may end up with a separation or a bad character separation just because you didn't want to get other people involved this is the opportunity to show that this incident doesn't define you and that your service was overall honorable and you can still get an honorable discharge through a board you could also get a general under honorable conditions both of which continue to leave you eligible for benefits we won't get into all the specifics of that during this webinar but as long as you've been in for a while uh, those well the honorable maintains your benefits but the general you obtain most so you want to make sure that again never waive anything and make sure you're presenting everything possible to get the characterization that you have rightfully earned even if you've slipped up again people make mistakes we shouldn't be a zero defect military although you hear that a lot um the other thing just uh quickly to touch on it doesn't happen at many boards but it can uh is the board could recommend to suspend the discharge that is the one thing that's not binding so like i said if the board recommends or says you didn't commit misconduct it's done the the person the separation authority can't change it if they recommend retention can't change it um, if they recommend a characterization basically the convening authority can do no worse than what the board recommended no matter how you look at it they can't do worse unless it comes to a suspension that's the one non-binding recommendation that can come out of a board um, basically when they say hey this does warrant separation and it would probably be a general discharge but we want to give them a second chance we recommend that this be suspended for six months and it's just like the njps if you don't do anything within that window you get retained you don't want to lean too heavy on that in the board because again it's not binding but this goes into the next portion of this is an appeal or a post board submission um, if you get a recommended suspension that is one of those times where you want to submit additional matters through your attorney or through your chain of command up to the separation authority to argue in support of that suspension being granted. Again, that's not binding, so you wanna give them extra ammo to, to justify that decision. If you take it out of that, if, if you lose, if you're not happy with the board decision, the, uh, the separation authority can give you better than what the board recommended. So while it may or may not be formalized in your individual instructions, uh, you can, submit additional information up to that separation authority saying i understand this is what the board said but i ask you to reconsider this look into this here's all this other information that you could can go through um you can do that in a paper packet you could also request an office call and i will tell you especially with officers going through separations being willing to stand on the carpet in front of the separation authority is a big deal uh, a lot of times just the fact that you offer it means something I can't guarantee you it gets a win, but it means something. So if you're willing to stand toe to toe in front of them and justify why you think you should be allowed to stay, I, I strongly recommend you give that opportunity. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be done uh, after the board. You can go to the separation authority. Technically, you can keep going beyond that. Again, it's not necessarily within the regulations but you could go to the uh, separation authorities supervisor and basically plead for relief there you could go up to the secretary secretary of the army secretary of the air force i know for a fact both sean and i have done that on behalf of our clients um, when we think the board got it wrong and that it's being condoned by that command that you know they violated their due process and they're pushing forward anyway we have no problem going straight to the secretary's office and saying hey this is uh this is uncalled for you need to do something so uh, allison just to piggyback on that real quick we have no qualms and no hesitation to email say the established advocate of the u.s army my co-counsel captains who just joined the jag corps will never send an email to a three-star general we <laughs> do that all the time so that's just one benefit you get when you're when you're when you have private counsel we will take steps that no uniformed attorney would dare touch that is definitely true um and, and like i said sometimes it does get you somewhere again there's no guarantee at that level but especially if there was a significant injustice um 
a lot of times you're talking about uh, situations where the person probably should have been pushed out through a medical disability retirement, and that's being completely ignored because they just want to hammer the individual. Uh, they, you know, vindictive action. They want to screw them over. They don't want them to have that opportunity. Those are the types of cases, especially that, you know, it, it's worth going up there. Um, I mean, obviously, every case is different. There's always factors to consider. But those are some options. And those are the things that nobody really tells you because it's not spelled out as an appellate step because it's not. It, it's basically a Hail Mary plea over top of the standard steps. But I strongly encourage you, if you're in any of these situations, um, to speak to the council about the options, about the strategy that you're pursuing. That should not be something that you're unaware of. I mean, yes, tactical decisions are made by your attorney, but you want to be part of that. You want to understand why they're doing what they're doing and whether they're actually pursuing all of the options available to you. Because at the end of the day, it's it's your life, it's your career. And it's your benefits that are on the line. So those are all things that are going to factor into how you proceed and also whether you want to stay with your military counsel, whether you think you have enough there and and where to go, what to do afterwards. So those are all things for the board. Um, well, the regular response, the board and the um, post board kind of while still in appeal to the higher channels. Uh, after that, I know a lot of our questions, and we can come back to some of the other questions um, at the end, but a lot of the questions that were posed were, what happens after you've been kicked out, you're no longer in the military, how do you fight that discharge now? And I will turn it over to our other presenter, Eric Duncan, to get into that. All right. so. You know, we hope that you never find yourself in that situation, first of all, to where you're now applying to one of these other boards. Nobody wants that, um, but there are a couple different options for you. So the first one is going to be your service specific discharge review boards. You have ones for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard. You have 15 years from the date of your separation to actually apply to one of these boards. Uh, there's a specific form you have to fill out. It's a DD-293. And what we really do when we're dealing with these is we like to build out a petition, and it's very similar to what you would do when you're dealing with the administrative separation boards. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into play. Um, you know, something might not warrant misconduct. Maybe the command made an arbitrary and capricious decision. There's a whole bunch of different things, and it's very, very fact-specific. Um, in about 2008, for example, uh, the former Secretary of Defense, uh, Hagel, he introduced a memo that essentially stated that these discharge re review boards now have to take into consideration and apply liberal guidance to anybody that, for example, was suffering from PTSD at the time of the misconduct. A couple years later, um, there was another memo that was issued, very, very similar guidance to the boards, and it stated that they had to apply liberal guidance to anybody that was potentially suffering from something like military sexual trauma, any type of underlying behavioral health condition that was either incurred or aggravated during service. And again, you know, if you're not going to the administrative separation board or not trying to fight this through, the command's not going to know these things. And, and the board is not going to know them either unless you actually raise these issues. So, for example, you know, if, if you have Sergeant Smith and, you know, uh, Sergeant Johnson, they might both be separated for the same offense, but they're definitely going to have vastly different service histories. Um, you know, they might both be separated with an OTH and, you know, one of them, let's say, you know, private or Sergeant Smith, for example, could have a lot of mitigating evidence in his service history. So what you wanna do is kind of just point to that mitigating evidence and make the argument that the decision of the command to issue another than honorable discharge, for example, wasn't warranted. That there was some other underlying cause for the initial misconduct. And, and you can do these for just about anything. Um, if the board, the discharge review board, decides to deny you your petition, you have three years to apply to the Board for Correction of Military Records or the Board for Correction of Naval Records. And again, these boards are all service specific. So you have ones for the Army, the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, 
the Coast Guard. The standard there is going to be an error or injustice. And, you know, it's almost the same process and the same thing, again, that you're doing with the Administrative Separation Board and the Discharge Review Board. You know, uh, as far as the error goes, you know, maybe you didn't do the misconduct. Uh, as far as the inequity goes, you know, maybe there was mitigating factors in your service record that didn't warrant that discharge that you actually received. So you got to make those arguments. And if it is something, you know, you're considering pursuing, I would definitely advise that you consult with, with counsel, whether it's, you know, our, our firm or any other buddy. You want somebody that's got experience doing that. Now, if the Board for Correction of Military Records happens to deny your petition, there are, you can appeal. Um, it's known as a request for reconsideration. You can file it at any single time. The only requirement is that you present either new evidence or new arguments. Now, typically, it takes about 18 months to two years before you'll receive a decision on these things, so it is a little bit of a waiting game. If for some reason you apply at the BCMR and, and they do deny that, uh, even if you go the request for reconsideration route, the Department of Defense did actually just create a new board with the 2020 NDA. This board is known as the Discharge Appeal Review Board. Now, it's, it's very, very specific, and it's only going to apply to anybody that was discharged on or after December 20th, 2020, or 2019. And, it, and it's essentially the same process you're going to go through when you're applying to the other boards. Um, you have to exhaust your administrative remedies, which means first you have to go to the Discharge Review Board. If they deny it, then you have to go over to the Board for Correction of Military or Naval Records. Once you get a decision from them, then you can apply to the Discharge Appeal Review Board. And I think that is all we have as far as the boards go. Sean, did you want to touch on the Board of Inquiry or anything like that? Happy, happy to do so. There are a couple of points I wanted to make. What kind of relief can you get with the DRB? Just to give a couple of illustrative facts of the stuff that we see, and we see it quite frequently. Often the government will rely on, say, perjured testimony to separate someone. Well, you get proof that that, that, that testimony was perjured. That's your evidence to get your discharge upgraded. And we've actually had that exact case. Or your individual who is a uh, service member you care about was served with separation packet while they were incapacitated in a mental hospital. I've had that exact case. This is kind of scandalous 60 minutes type stuff that we frankly see every single day in our office. I, I'm quite exhausted, honestly, with the corruption in the military. So this is my opportunity here to editorialize just a little bit, just to kind of get, get a little punch on, on the stomach to the, to, to the military service branches. These government attorneys feel immune from culpability. Why? Because I have not seen a state bar remove the law license of a military prosecutor. Why have I not seen that? Because nobody reports them for their ethical violations. And if they do get reported for ethical violations, it's papered over by the service branches and say, oh, everything is fine, nobody cares. And the state bars will say, oh, we defer to the military to do whatever they want. So you have a lot of rogue government actors ruining people's lives day in and day out, engaged in unbelievable ethical misconduct with no repercussions for their misbehavior because they're doing what the command wants them to do. They're getting rid of X, Y, or Z that they consider to be less desirable. So if they don't like the person, they will manufacture evidence. They will take perjured testimony. They will serve people with packets while they're incapacitated in a mental hospital. This is stuff that we see frequently, and it happens over and over again. Now, when we, when we can prove it, we can get your relief. How do we get six figures of back pay rewarded or people reinstated back in the military? You have pretty egregious facts like this, and these facts are quite common. And Defense Finance Accounting Service often cuts checks to people for two or three years of back pay to have them reinstated back on active duty because they were unlawfully discharged. What, that is a waste of government money, it's a waste of tax dollars, but it happens all the time. Now, statistically, it's rare, but from a legal office point of view, it's pretty common. We see it quite a bit. So I just wanted to get that out there, that if you feel like this is the worst thing that's ever happened and it, is, it can only be me and they're targeting me specifically, that's not true. They act with impunity across all branches, and they often engage in rogue behavior, and they feel immune from culpability. And if you stand up to it, if you actually object to it, you end up like myself and Ms. Weber, and you leave the military because you're yourself disgusted by it. So I personally 
got tired of being told, hey, Captain Timmons, you're advocating too hard for those soldiers. Uh, you got to, you know, play nice with the, with the other side. No, I, I don't do that. Our duty, and I'm licensed in Texas, I'm licensed in New York, I'm licensed in other jurisdictions. But my duty as an advocate in Texas is to zealously represent my client. And that is it. Not My duty is not to be nice to the government. My duty is not to make deals with them and play golf and, and shake hands and be polite. My duty is exclusively and solely as a zealous representative of our attorney to use all lawful means to get the best result possible. Trial defense, area defense counsel, they have other cases. We go from installation to installation. We never see the same people twice, usually. Or if we do, it's, it's they're out of there pretty quickly. They PCS every couple of years. So if we if we embarrass the Fort Hood Military Justice Shop, there'll be new people in soon enough. They, they'll forget about us, and the new people can get embarrassed later. But if you're there every single day, then you have to have what's called, you know, committee and, and mutual agreements and all kinds of gentlemen's agreements and, and backroom deals. Lots of that stuff goes on. We don't play those games. And what we're doing when somebody hires us and what everybody should be doing, this is how I follow every military case. Every law has, you know, elements. Like, for example, arson is the malicious burning of the dwelling of another with the intent to destroy permanently. Those are many elements. All of those have to be satisfied to, for it to be criminal arson. Well, in the military, they often forget elements when it comes to proving crimes. Like for unlawful drug use, they have to show knowing and intentional knowledge. They have to show knowledge that you, you, you actually engaged in the impermissible use of the substance. Just having it detected in your system because you, you inhaled it or you, you ate it in a brownie when you didn't know it had marijuana in it doesn't make you culpable. So they often forget they have to prove elements of the offense. So we often attack the cases from the government by simply dis, dis, negating the fact they can't prove an element that that's required to, to get their adverse result. They often then respond with, well, it's only a preponderance of the evidence. Doesn't matter if the standard is only probable cause, preponderance, clear and convincing evidence, or beyond a reasonable doubt. If the element's missing, no standard of evidence is applicable. Therefore, the misconduct can't be substantiated. Therefore, you should be exonerated. So if they're missing the knowledge element of unlawful drug use, doesn't matter if the standard is preponderance, 50.01%, or clear and convincing, say 60 to 70%, or beyond a reasonable doubt, 89%. If that element's simply missing, you should be retained. So often in the military, you're almost having to disprove negatives. You have to almost go out of your way to prove you are not the offender. For example, I had an RTC case where the investigation was completely one-sided and the allegation was sexually inappropriate behavior. Well, we actually went out and got witness statements that said she removed his clothes and she was the, she, she was the aggressor. Guess what? He got retained. But he had to affirmatively show, no, I wasn't the, the sexual deviant, the alleged victim was actually the one who was being aggressive towards me. We got statements, we obtained that evidence, we used that in our board proceedings, and we got our client retained. So what, you, what your attorney is responsible to do often is build your file, build your case, investigate options, not just roll over for the government and take this, the, the quick deal and get out there. If your attorney is serious and aggressive, they will look into all possible avenues of redress. Now, often, no matter what they look at, if the evidence is overwhelming and the elements are met, you may well be, lack of a better term, have no choice but to take the best deal you're going to get. That is sometimes the analysis. Often, though, the government forgets to bring the case with them because they're just running through massive piles of paper and they, they, they don't look at the um, details and we get into the weeds of it. And what I do in every case, when I want to get back to, I break every case into four factors. Drama. Why was there an investigation started? Because drama happened in your life. You were late to work. You had another girlfriend when you were married. You, you, you used drugs when you shouldn't have. You had a DUI when you drank too much because you were over exhausted from working 70 hours a week. Whatever it might be, there was drama. That drama led to an investigation. That investigation is looking into the quote scandal, the scandal of the adulterous affair, the scandal of the drunken driving, the scandal of the illicit drug use, the scandal of the, uh, you know, being late to work 12 times and blowing off your colleagues, whatever this, whatever that might be. But first there's drama, then there's a scandal, but almost predictably, almost cartoonishly laughable, the military almost always, and I see it almost every case I, I get, there's corruption. 
Corruption is their excessive response to the, to the, to the drama and the scandal. Instead of getting a person help, like sending them to alcohol rehab, sending them to drug rehab, getting them behavioral health treatment, having compassion, treating them with dignity and respect, they act vindictive, they act maliciously, they act excessively harsh, and that's where the corruption sets in. That's where they overcharge. So that soldiers like deformation twice, they accuse them of being like deformation 20 times. That's corrupt. That's fraud. He's not only, only been late twice, they'll accuse him of doing, doing it 20 times. They try to browbeat him into submission to accept uh, an immediate, you know, uh, re resolution to, to the separation and have him papered out the door quickly. They try to do this all the time and they put you under duress. That's the uh, corrupt part. What are we doing as the attorney, as the advocate? What should your attorney be doing if you have one? Your attorney should be writing your story of redemption. That's the final factor. Redemption is your opportunity to show, look, yes, I had a deficiency, or yes, I was accused of this. Even though I'm innocent, I was accused of it. I'm apologizing to command for putting you through the problem of having to investigate me for whatever I'm being accused of. So even if you're completely innocent, you still have to kind of apologize for being under the investigative inquiry because they, they like to see that. Your story of redemption is how you get exonerated, how you get vindicated, and how you move on to have a new career, hopefully at a new assignment, new installation, and a new opportunity to start fresh and continue to retirement. That's what we are best at, writing that story of redemption. Whether that story of redemption involves uh, falling on your sword and apologizing for what happened, or if your story involves gathering evidence to actually prove you are the victim of a malicious hoax and uh, you're being, lies are being told about you, such as the example I provided where we proved um, our client who was um, facing allegations for sexually inappropriate behavior was actually um, innocent by cooperating witnesses who testified that no, the quote victim actually was a sexually aggressive individual who and, and made a knowingly false complaint. We see knowingly false complaints all the time. That's pretty common in my practice. Statistics say it's rare, but from a legal perspective, I see it in my practice all the time. So I, I, I question the statistics out there. A lot of the questions we had were about the military changing and, and are they doing certain things? I will say, the military has changed the regulations and the rules quite a bit over the last 30 years. So if you've been in the military for a long time, things are quite different. You know, in 1991, Army regulations said homosexual behavior is service discrediting. Now, you know, we have transgender individuals. So there has been an evolution in the regulations. Doesn't mean the military, though, doesn't still do everything the way they've always done it. It just means, yes, there's been changes to the rules, there's been changes to the regulations, um, and we've tried to be more accommodating. A lot of that, honestly, is PR. In my personal opinion, the military will say they care about mental health, but the reality is you get ostracized for it quite a bit. I would still encourage everybody to get treatment, though, for it. I would encourage you to get it and document it and, and try to don't neglect your medical care just because you're afraid of being ostracized by your unit or your, or your colleagues. Um, that's utmost important. And your health is more important than your career. That's my personal opinion about that. Um, Additionally, what we didn't touch on, but I think we, can, we have time to address it, is if everything fails, do you have a remedy in court? Yes, yes, you do. You can go to district court and, and sue under the Administrative Procedures Act to say that the military violated um, you know, by, by engaging in arbitrary capricious behavior, manifestly unfair decision, they, they simply violated their own rules and regulations, you should be granted relief in district court. That's under the Administrative Procedures Act. You can also, under the Tucker Act, go to the Federal Court of Federal Claims and sue for back wages and back pay because you were wrongfully discharged. That's federal litigation, significant monetary investment to pursue that, but it could be rewarding if you get a, you know, good facts and a good outcome. Sean, if I could jump in real quick here. Yes, um, please do. I saw a couple of questions in here that kind of from my section. So. Um, I do want to first and foremost say that anybody who tells you a discharge is going to be automatically upgraded has lied to you, whether they know they did or not. It doesn't matter. That's a lie. You have to petition to do it. And there's a lot of questions in here about, you know, how do you do it? So when I was explaining that you need to provide your side of the story, um, Sean's mental health comment made uh, a big impression there. There are a lot of people who they are being in their mind punished and maybe they are, you know, again, we see this all the time, um, really for what was more of a mental health issue. So sometimes it, it's the evidence that never got to the board um, or never was considered because it wasn't available at the time. Maybe you didn't seek treatment in because you were afraid of being ostracized or 
you were afraid of how that would impact your security clearance or any any number of things that have gone on, especially in the past 20 years. Um, you may have that evidence now. You may be able to provide those records. The other thing is, is there's a lot of people who may not be willing to write statements on your behalf at the time you're getting separated. But, you know, three years later, they're not in the same unit. They don't have the same concern about, you know, snitching on their platoon sergeant for how he treated you and what really went down on that day. You can go back to those people. This is the one benefit to social media. You can find people a lot easier than you used to. Um, you can go back and reach out to some of those folks and a simple letter of, from another person who is serving alongside you that says, I saw this happen, even if it's a minor detail, I saw this happen. Um, you know, I saw the person uh, actually get hurt. It wasn't that they refused to train. Their knee was swollen to twice the size it, you know, was when we started the ruck. I don't know how they specifically hurt themselves, but they weren't refusing. They got injured. And I don't know why they got booted out the door. You know, those are the types of things that you can go back and get that you might not have been able to at the time of your discharge. And those are the types of things that we put together when we petition the board. The other point I would highlight is, is if you want to go to the discharge review board or you want to go to the board for correction of military records. And by the way, uh, depending on the nature, if you were discharged by court martial, you may have to go to the board for corrections. Just there are certain things. Again, I would do some research or consult with an attorney. I strongly recommend that you put a lot of time and energy into whatever your first petition is. Um, and this is why we recommend attorneys not to get us business because your first shot at the board is traditionally your best shot. Um, when you go for the motions for consideration uh, or the follow on actions, like you can still win, but you're going to have to do a lot more legwork because there's a presumption that they do things right. And so you got to overcome that. You got to, you got to overcome the fact that they've already decided this once. So, you truly want to go into that first board with as much ammo as you can get. And that may mean doing a lot of legwork for investigation, hiring an attorney to break down all the regulatory violations that happened. Um, those are the types of things that you can challenge your discharge. It's not, you're not going to win if you submit just the DD-293 to the board, the discharge review board, or submit the DD-149 to the board for corrections. You need to put something with it. There's got to be a story. There's got to be an expl explanation. There's got to be some supporting records. It may be, you know, family letters. It may be other service members. You're not really limited, but you need to put something down on paper for the board to, you know, hang their hat on because they don't want to go against what happened unless they have a good reason why. That's what you need to get for them, however you want to do it. So um, mental health, though, is something I would strongly, strongly, strongly consider if you have um, any concerns, go seek help. For one thing, your mental health is the most important thing, uh, hands down, that you should be taking care of yourself uh, throughout your time in the military. But two, and this is going to sound cynical, but, you know, it's my job here. Uh, mental health bases are, are some of the most commonly granted uh, upgrades. So if you have developed a record of seeking treatment and continue to seek it, um, even if you don't, but like, if you have a record of, I was trying to get help and, you know, they screwed me over it, it helps your case. So again, cynical as that may be, um, it's another valid reason to go. So. And we'll get into the weeds on that a little bit, Allison, make sure, um, to, to, if you have combat related PTSD, even if it's aggravated by underlying conditions, such as, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, Bipolar doesn't really manifest itself until 25 or 30, the literature shows. So a lot of individuals join the military at 18, they get diagnosed with bipolar by the time of 25, the time of 30. What happens then, they have PTSD mixed together. They have overlapping symptoms. The DSM-5 is out, and a lot of the symptoms are the same, but the conditions are different. Don't worry about the specifics of the condition. If you've got evidence that shows anxiety or depression or, or, or other mental health impairment that may have impacted your judgment, that could have been explained by the, the misconduct could have been explained by the mental health impairment. That usually isn't going to entitle you to relief unless the misconduct is substantially egregious. What that means in English is unless it's really, really awful and you have like a TBI, dramatic brain injury, or you have PTSD, or you have a, a, a cocktail of anxiety and bipolar and other conditions, and you did something relatively minor, but it caused you to get an OTH. That should grant you relief to at least get a general discharge. Why is general discharge so important? For three main reasons. One, 
It allows you to have VA care and VA disability compensation. Two, it's credited towards employment. A lot of states, a lot of municipalities will grant you retirement benefits. Uh, you can buy into retirement programs based on your military service if you have at least a general discharge. And number three, it, it allows you to have you know ongoing benefits when you get to re retirement. If you have an OTH, it's almost like you never joined the military. Your benefits are gone, and you have a stigma now associated with your records indefinitely. Obviously, the honorable is the gold standard. Why the honorable gold standard? You have the GI Bill. You get an interest rate reduction on your mortgage. You get home loan programs. So honorable is the gold standard. But even if you don't have an honorable, having a general opens up probably about 80% of the benefits available. Having an OTH makes your benefits near zero. Now, there are certain jurisdictions like New York City and others that do grant you some benefits for any military service, regardless of your discharge. But that's very limited case by case basis and up to the local municipality or local jurisdiction to grant you any derivative benefits they determine are appropriate. Um, federally speaking, you need a general discharge to get federal level benefits. Um, and that's why it's so important to get, get at least a general discharge upon leaving the military. And again, the commanders have a lot of discretion on how they do things. Unfortunately, when you sign that enlistment agreement or you sign take it over the office as a commissioned officer, there's a caveat under everything that says quote needs of the army needs of the air force that language is contractually been interpreted by the supreme court to pretty much allow them to do anything what that means is if like in the civil war general grant ordered seven thousand soldiers to, to literally die at cold harbor that was a lawful order he ordered seven thousand union troops to charge a, a, a defensive perimeter that resulted in their immediate death so if the military can order you to die basically in combat to fulfill the mission they can do just about anything they want uh, because they have the lawful authority to do so. So just historically speaking, the military has ordered people to perform their duties that knowing that they're very likely to suddenly die in combat. So if they can do that, they can do a lot of other things too. What you got, what you got to do though, if you have a military career is try to put yourself in the best position possible by knowing your legal rights, but also know the limitations to those rights. A lot of attorneys that don't practice this area a lot of individuals will muck things up substantially because they're analogizing it to civil proceedings or civil situations in the employment setting. For example, HIPAA does not apply in the military. I often get calls all the time. Well, my commander violated my HIPAA rights. The HIPAA statute specifically says it does not apply to members of the military. So if you think you are right, your HIPAA rights are being violated, well, you signed an enlistment agreement. You've therefore, by signing that agreement, waived all rights to HIPAA. So there's and there's lots of examples of that. Um, Title Seven, the Civil Rights Act, does not apply to the military. The military does have policies that prevent discrimination, but is there any actual meat to those policies? That's debatable. Why? Because Title Seven doesn't apply to the military. There is legislation to change that, but it's not in effect yet. So a lot of statutory protections, a lot of laws that you may hear about on the news or you may read about on Google, they have a caveat. They simply don't apply to the military. HIPAA is a great example of that. So you have no HIPAA rights in the military. You have none. Zero. Zilch. I'm sorry to be so blunt about it, but I see that almost every day. An accusation that, oh, my HIPAA rights are being violated. I should have redress and there should be repercussions to my command for violating HIPAA. There, there's, no, there's no HIPAA rights. HIPAA does not exist in the military. Now, as a retiree, you may have HIPAA, HIPAA rights. Um, but again, another thing about retirees, you're always subject to recall. As a benefit to your, as a, the Supreme Court has ruled that by taking compensation from the military, you're always subject to being called back to active duty and prosecuted. Now, the military will rarely do that, but it's always technically possible. So, if you're a military retiree, you're always subject to the UCMJ. That means um, pandering prostitutes, even though it might be legal in Nevada, the UCMJ criminalizes that. You're still technically violating the UCMJ and you're still technically subject to the UCMJ. Now, is the command going to pull you back on active duty or prosecute you for that? Extremely unlikely, but you're still subject to the UCMJ. So that's just one little warning that I think everybody should be aware of. If you're taking military retirement compensation for the rest, for the duration of your life, the duration of that compensation, you're, you're subject to the UCMJ. That's something that very few will actually understand the full ramifications of, but it is uh, an important detail. Um, there's a lot of overlap with the IDES process and the separation process. What we should inform you of, I mean, we didn't make it clear earlier, is if you're in IDES, if you've been referred for a broken leg and you can no longer walk and you're in a wheelchair, but then you smoke marijuana, 
what's going to happen is you're in IDES already. You're getting, you're going to get this, you get mental disability rating for your broken leg. But now you smoke marijuana, the command's also going to notify you of mandatory processing for drug abuse. Although marijuana is technically, you know, permissible in 40 states, it remains criminal in all, all, all jurisdictions. Why? Because the supremacy clause of the federal government makes marijuana a criminal prohibition. So the federal government has not legalized marijuana. States have decided not to prosecute. That's fine. States don't have to prosecute. But the federal government still has it as a prohibited substance. So if you're in the military and you use marijuana, it doesn't matter what the state says, federal law is supreme. The military will mandatorily process you out. So if you have a broken leg and you use marijuana, just the commanding general is going to have to decide, should we separate you for the broken leg and for your medical disability rating, or should we separate you for misconduct? And if you're at Fort Bragg or you're at Fort Hood or you're at some of these other hardcore installations, or you've got some Air Force commander like a Travis Air Force base that's rogue, they're probably going to separate you for misconduct, even though you have substantially mitigating evidence regarding your disability. So what we see often is what I call the brag and hood enhancement. If you're at one of those installations, you're going to get the book thrown at you. That's unfortunate, but that's the reality we face. And that's why it's even more important to have aggressive representation to fight back strongly on that on your behalf. Um, we're, we're about two minutes out. Any closing um, different pieces of information you wanted to add, Allison, that we haven't touched or Eric? I would just add that there's a lot of questions that were presented that are very fact specific. So obviously we don't have the time or, or the ability to address all of those on top of which I'm sure there are additional facts beyond what was submitted in your uh, registration. But you absolutely can reach out and request a consult to go over whether or not you have a case. Um, and, and I would say that for a lot of things, if you have a legal question, don't be afraid to go see base legal or call a civilian law firm to ask those questions. There are a lot of things that, I mean, you don't know that you don't know for that matter. Like the, there's the regulations, they change, they're different. Um, you can't rely on what your chain of command has told you they say, because half the time they don't know. Even if they're being straight up and trying to be nice, they may not know um, the available options for you. So if you have questions, make sure you seek assistance, um, whether it's through the base legal or a civilian firm. I agree. Now, well, I worked as administrative law at three court at Fort Hood for a little while. And what I noticed was there's multiple army regulations that say you must do X. Then there's also multiple regulations that say you may never do X. That happens all the time. So you may find a regulation that says you must do X, but then there's another regulation that says you can never do X under any condition. So it's like, well, wait a minute, how do we get, how do we resolve these? That requires an attorney's legal analysis to determine conflict of regulation, conflict of laws, which one takes priority. There's all kinds of exceptions to every rule. And unfortunately, lawyers write the law to keep them fully employed. So there's always a rule, but then there's 20 exceptions to it that try to erase the rule entirely. So you may find a law on the, on the internet that says A, but then B, C, and D kind of make the law null and void because B, C, and D are exceptions that make the law not really applicable. For HIPAA is a great example of that. Um, it doesn't apply in the military. So if you learned anything tonight, remember a few things. There's always an opportunity to, to make things better. If your command is coming after you to separate you, don't roll over, fight back because you're, you're, the long-term benefit to you is substantial. You're talking about the next 40, 50 years of your life at a minimum uh, after you're leaving military service and you want to have your records corrected. And if you've also, one thing we didn't touch on, but I'll touch on really quick. If you've served in say Vietnam or Korean War and you had a really bad discharge and the facts are awful, still apply for an upgrade because if you've had three or four decades of good life experience, they may grant you a discharge upgrade solely based on post-service meritorious behavior. For example, I had a Los Angeles police officer who got an OTH for desertion in Vietnam. He served then four decades on the Los Angeles police force. The board took that into consideration and said, look, meritorious service of the people of Los Angeles, they grant him a discharge upgrade so he could die with dignity and have uh, burial rights uh, for his family. So you'll always have the opportunity to go back to these boards based on decades of good behavior, regardless of what your facts may have been. So never stop fighting. If there's one thesis of this entire presentation, it is fight back, fight back hard, protect yourself, protect your rights, but do so knowingly and intelligently. And how do you do that? You've got to consult with, um, with, with counsel. Um, and we're here for you if you want to discuss further. Everybody's case is different. So I apologize for the 
generic nature of this presentation, but unfortunately necessary because we're covering multiple branches of service, multiple overlapping regulations, and we're tonight covering just the basic highlighted themes that we see um, day in and day out. But everybody's case is different and everybody deserves individualized attention to your specific facts. So thank you for joining us tonight and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue the series. We'll have other presentations as the months proceed and we'll try to touch on additional topics as we move forward. Thank you.